We bring you advice and compelling insight on the latest in health, medicine, and scientific discovery. From tips for getting better sleep to discussions about major issues like health disparities in America, we'll talk about it. You're listening to Texas A&M Health Talk, part of the Texas A&M Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Texas A&M Health Talk. I'm your host, Lindsay Hendricks. If you're an avid Health Talk listener, which I'm sure about two of you tuning in right now are avid Health Talk listeners, you'll notice this is different for us. And you're right, because we used to have about five different shows under the Health Talk umbrella. And now we've decided to consolidate all of that excellent content into a single show this awesome podcast called Health Talk, hosted by yours truly. So this is episode one. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this this episode is going to be a little bit different than what you'll experience down the road because we are still very much in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm recording from my home office and my guests are joining us today via Zoom. But, you know, I I felt like we really needed to dig into this topic because what we're going to talk about today is incredibly pertinent for a lot of people. And that is mental health. You know, we're, we're in unprecedented times right now. I know you're sick of hearing that term by now, unprecedented times, but it's true. This is something that we've never navigated, at least not in this generation, and definitely not in the way that we're navigating it right now. So mental health is something that I think a lot of people are thinking about right now. Many people are having a difficult time, and that's to be expected because it's very, our, our lives have changed so drastically, so rapidly. Our world doesn't look like it did just weeks ago. So I have with us today the lovely and brilliant Dr. Carly McCord. Carly is the director of the Texas A&M Health Telebehavioral Care Program, and she's also a clinical assistant professor in the Texas A&M College of Medicine. And along with Carly, we've got Bradley Bogdan. Brad is a licensed clinical social worker, and he works with the psychiatry and behavioral health program here at Texas A&M Health. So thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. So let's just go ahead and dive right on into this topic. Like I said in the introduction, life has changed so drastically, so rapidly. I feel like a lot of people are struggling right now. You know, a lot of us are still working from home. Kids haven't been in school for a while, and we're not entirely sure when they'll go back. And we just don't seem like we're quite as socially connected as we were just weeks ago. So in general, in in your professional opinion, how are Americans doing right now? How how are we doing? Are, Are you seeing an increase in stress and anxiety and depression and things like that right now? Yeah, I think... We are, you know, having routine and consistency for both adults and kids are some of the things that give us just uh, the constancy in life um, to know what to predict. And when we know what we can predict, then we feel like we can cope. And so having new things thrown our way um, and being separated socially from many people that we care about definitely is taking a toll on people from what I can experience personally and you know what we're seeing in our clinics and just what we're hearing from folks around the state and the nation and the world (laughs) yeah that's so true i think we tend to think about this as americans because this is our experience but this is a worldwide issue and stress anxiety and depression and mental health issues aren't just unique to americans or citizens of the united states so if you're tuning in overseas or from somewhere else around the world, uh, just know that we're talking to you too. So have y'all seen an increase in people seeking services? Have you, have you noticed uh, more people coming into the clinics lately? I know here in our outpatient clinic, um, we've seen about a 50% jump in people seeking services. So uh, that is probably not entirely due to the pandemic, but I am sure a, a giant portion of it is being that it kind of happened at the same time over the last few months. And I know in the, the, the first month or two of uh, lockdown, um, the National Suicide Hotline uh, also saw a giant spike in terms of calls. And fortunately, 
um, their assessment of that that uh, increase um, was fortunately not necessarily the that amount of people looking to um, get help for suicidal thoughts, but it was very much um, reaching out to have some contact to talk to a professional uh, and not really knowing where to start. And um, fortunately, they do a great job of making sure they're out there and available as a resource. And uh, they were able to, to kind of help with that surge of folks looking for help and get them directed to the right places. Um, so it is definitely, uh, definitely real. Yeah. And it's good that people are reaching out, right? Because I think if you look back just a few years ago, a lot of people either weren't aware of the signs that maybe you should seek some professional help, but there was also so much stigma surrounding mental illness and mental health issues. So in your experience, how is that trending these days? Are we seeing more people open to talking about mental health issues? I, I would say yes, um, that because it's such a shared experience that it's really hard for anyone to be going through uh, this pandemic and just the racial and cultural tensions that we're experiencing uh, here in the U.S. And, and even that is a global issue as well. Um, it's, it's hard to not bring attention to mental health issues. And I mean, I, I'm talking about those figures earlier, I, I think that there is some relation then to an increase in, in seeking services and hopefully that correlates too to a reduction in stigma or fear of uh, reaching out. I know that um, across the globe, there's been uh, huge increases in telehealth use and breaking down of barriers that clinicians and proponents of telehealth have been fighting for for years in terms of reimbursement um, and regulations uh, that may have prevented accessing those services that those many of those kind of broke down overnight and so it's made it um, easier to access care in the comfort of your home but I think all of that helps kind of break down stigma when more people are using it experiencing it um, then it becomes less of this you know scary unknown um, and now, you know, somebody who's tried it and was like, oh, telehealth is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would definitely uh, want to try it out if I heard from a friend that I trusted that it, that it's good. And so from a professional standpoint, though, it, are there differences between telehealth and in-person services? Um, are you going to find differences in the quality or the outcomes between the two? I was going to say, Carly's group has done some fantastic research on um, the fact that people seem to get the same benefit from in-person therapy as they do via telehealth. Yeah, having done telehealth for over a decade, I definitely like it a lot. I wouldn't keep doing it. Um, so all of our data has shown that outcomes are similar, uh, at least from the behavioral health side of being able to see someone from a distance like this, it's still, you're still able to make a connection. Uh, the, the treatments we use, the evidence-based uh, therapies and things are, they transfer, it's talk therapy. Um, I think in some cases we even see, in a lot of our trauma clients, we see um, being able to do this from the comfort of their home actually provides an additional layer of safety and security. Some people even like it better. Um, you know, I think on the primary care side and other specialty disciplines, it can be harder to get vital signs and things, but it's, there's so much that can be done in preventative care just by asking questions and checking on symptoms and connecting with people that all of that can be done from a distance. Yeah, I can say even from just a professional standpoint, I think a lot of us are working from home right now and it's it's kind of nice because as we're all getting more savvy with this teleconferencing systems and stuff like we're doing right now, recording this podcast, right? Um, it's kind of nice to get to see people in their houses. I see you in your house. I see you in your office. And I feel like seeing people in their own environment kind of adds a level of, of personability or something. Like I can get to know you a little better just seeing you in your own environment. So do you think that applies to counseling as well? Absolutely. Um, in a couple of previous jobs I had, I was doing primarily in-home services. And even when somebody says, um, oh, things are going great, if you notice that all the dishes are stacked up, or if you notice that um, the, the laundry hasn't been done in a couple of weeks, or some of those other signs that you, you wouldn't necessarily hear if they were coming into the office uh, and, and not necessarily feeling comfortable to talk as openly as, as you might hope they would, 
um, you can totally see when you've got a window into, into where they're living and, and where they're spending all of their time. So um, it can be a big benefit to, to be able to see into, into somebody's home. And kind of like Carly mentioned, it, it really helps kind of deepen the, the relationship in a way too, because you know, the, the relationship is different with somebody that you invite into your home to do something, even digitally than it is when you go out to a third third party location to just meet and do something. So um, yeah, it can, it can push that therapeutic relationship another step farther. And that brings up another point, which is what are some of the warning signs that maybe you don't have it all together mentally or emotionally, and maybe you should seek some professional help? You mentioned dishes stacked in, in the sink or laundry not being done, and there could be a variety of ways that it could manifest, right? So can you list some of those warning signs that you might see? Sure. Um, I lo- the, the things that, that tell me most is not necessarily specifically um, somebody getting behind on the laundry, getting behind the, on the dishes, because obviously mm-hmm. that happens to all of us, but big changes in routine. Um, if somebody is typically really on top of those things and then isn't, that should be uh, a sign that something, something is off and, and you need to ask. Big changes in sleep. Um, you know, if somebody is, is used to getting a full night of sleep and they're not able to get to bed or they're not able to stay asleep once they're asleep, um, can be a really important indicator of uh, something uh, being off or uh, uh, some kind of stress or anxiety or depression building up. And then uh, differences in how they're interacting with other people. Um, if somebody is typically, um, you know, really bright and cheery or typically uh, maybe not very talkative and you see their behavior change or the way they interact with other people change, um, that also can be a really, really important sign that, hey, you know, you should ask and see if something's going on or, or if they're connected with the people they need to be connected with. And, Uh, feel supported. Right. Yeah. And so how would you advise broaching that subject with somebody? You know, you're noticing a a family member or a friend who seems to be having a hard time. How do you, how do you open up that conversation and, and get them to talk about it? Um, that's a good question. I would say there's probably no one right way to do that. Often, I think, you know, when we are just caring and concerning selves, um, that we often know our friends and our family pretty well, that you can uh, trust your gut in trying to think about a way to broach that subject. I think just the most important part is that you do broach the subject. If you're worried about somebody, um, being able to ask them, um, hey, you know, I'm I'm really worried about you. All this affirm, you know, all this is really hard and there's a lot of challenges and I've noticed it seems like you're not sleeping very well. Um, do you want to talk about that? Have you thought about talking to somebody else about that? Um, I think that's really important. Um, it makes me think of the suicide question, um, that there's a myth out there that if you ask someone, are you thinking about taking your life or killing yourself, that you're going to put that idea in someone's head. Um, and I guess, want to take this opportunity to dispel that myth specifically that um, it's okay to ask, you know, how's your sleep? Are you eating? Hey, have you, you know, you've seemed really down. It's been, you just seem really blue. Have you thought about um, hurting yourself or taking your life? Um, And then you don't have to be a mental health professional to know what to do next. If someone says, yes, your next thing is, can I get you some help? (laughs) Can I help you get connected? And that can be your role um, is, is just to help make phone calls, Google providers, talk to insurance companies, whatever kind of those barriers, whatever's getting in that person's way, are there barriers that you can kind of help break down for that person? Yeah. And so when you are ready to make that next step, what do you Google? You know, what do you look for? Who do you call? What kinds of professionals are qualified to provide that kind of care and help for mental health? I was going to say, where, wherever folks are, are listening to this from, there is um, almost, at least in the U.S., there is uh, a couple different national helplines um, for mental health and suicide. Also, every locality in the U.S. as part of the uh, funding they get through Medicaid has uh, a more local helpline uh, for mental health emergencies. Um, we have one here in the Brazos Valley that's uh, run out of our local public mental health provider, and if there is an emergency and you call that number, um, there will be somebody there within a half an hour and usually a lot sooner to be able to respond to that crisis. If somebody is not in an emergency, um, there are a lot of different places that you can you can go to seek services. 
through your insurer, if somebody has uh, health insurance, uh, they will always provide you a list of uh, local mental or local individuals who can provide those mental health services uh, under your under your insurance plan. Every county in the U.S. Uh, again through that same national funding has a public mental health provider. Sometimes they're an overburdened resource, but um, they are they exist every place. Uh, and then. Um, you know, Carly it does a great job of reaching out to a lot of underserved communities through telehealth. Are there more, are there more clinics like your own, like our own Carly that, that reach out to those underserved areas to, to treat people? Yeah, often training clinics, uh, whether that be for um, social workers or master's level licensed professional counselors, marriage and family therapists, uh, psychology doctoral programs, um, often will have uh, training clinics associated with them or trainees that operate on sliding fee scales or provide free services. Um, so uh, one of my former graduates and postdoctoral fellows created a website um, called Low Cost Help, but it is a resource where they've compiled different, um, ac uh, across all of the states, uh, different low cost mental health resources. And yeah, I, I think different, different licensures and credentials uh, have some built-in security and established standards for training and previous experiences uh, that give you a um, you know some kind of stamp or guarantee on some of the shared set of experiences and trainings that they've had um, that you can rest assured um, often in those licenses and credentials uh, we certainly don't necessarily have a corner market on change though with a credential um, that there are, you know, culturally there can be healers in different cultures that may seem more appropriate. I, at the end of the day, I would rather someone um, reach out for help um, than not get any help at all. But I, I would lean towards recommending um, someone that is licensed and, and credentialed uh, in your state. And say you're not quite ready to seek professional help yet. You feel like you're struggling a little bit, but maybe there are some things that you can just change yourself to help kind of build that resiliency during this health crisis and, and other crises that you may encounter in your life down the road. What are some things that you can do yourself? I just have a flood of things come to my mind. Uh, I mean, <laughs> number one, um, I just think that, um, in my opinion, you know, hurt and pain uh, thrive in the darkness and in secrecy. And so um, anytime you can reach out and tell someone um, what you're struggling with, uh, that that is a major win uh, in and of itself, aside from setting lofty goals for, um, you know, maybe um, things that we know are really helpful, like journaling, uh, gratitude journals, you know, trying to focus on the positive things. Uh, that are going on in your life and the basics, you know, of that you cannot underestimate the positive impact of getting seven to nine hours of sleep a night um, and, you know, putting healthy foods into your body and getting up and moving in between your Zoom meetings or at some point in the day where you put your body in motion and that um, all of those, even just setting small goals it's got to be, a, it's got to be attainable um, to, to let it come true. So you don't have to set this, I'm going to work out an hour every day uh, for the next month. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to walk in between one Zoom meeting a day and try and do something that you can do is going to improve your mental health. Yeah, yeah, that reminds me of something I heard the other day. Um, somebody who had just recovered from alcoholism was saying, you know, you don't have to not drink alcohol every day for the rest of your life. You just have to not drink that day. And I found that so helpful because it really breaks it down into what you can do that day, right? You know, you just do what you can do that day and don't worry about, you know, working out every day for the rest of your life or something like that. So do you think some advice like that would be helpful? Absolutely. Um, I know did, just like Carly was mentioning, the things that I've been, been working with my own therapy clients on um, have been those small things that they, that they do on a daily basis. So have you picked up the phone to call somebody that you care about today and, and have that connection that you might otherwise be missing out on? 
Um, have you gone outside today? Did you, did you take a shower and throw on a, a, a new set of clothes? They, they sound kind of silly and basic, but when you have uh, some sort of established routine um, of those good sort of things, even when they're little, um, that provides so much uh, benefit in terms of resilience um, that it is, it's, it's tough to overstate. Yeah. And, and routine reminds me so much of, of how routine helps young children. Um, I, like I've said before, I'm a parent of, of two littles. And so how can we help our kids during this time? Um, how can we help from small children who are used to going to daycare every day to teenagers who aren't seeing their friends, they're not going out and, and going to parties and things like that? How can we help support their mental and emotional well-being during this time? I found that the, the first thing that seems to have helped um, the families that I'm working with is being able to share your own feelings and thoughts uh, with your kids in age appropriate language. One of, one of my favorite folks that works with kids is, is not somebody who's licensed, but it was, it was Mr. Rogers. Um, and he very famously developed an entire um, kind of way of speaking through uh, the scripts in his shows that was very uh, concrete and directed at the age group he was, he was looking to work with because until we're, we're reasonably old, um, kids don't have a, a, a great handle on language that isn't concrete and, and uh, very firm in what, it's, in what it means. So being able to say, hey, uh, Cindy or Bobby, you know, I'm sad too because I haven't been able to go out and see my friends today um, is a great way of sharing some of the fact that you're struggling with this too. And then, you know, figuring out a way to do some of those restorative things uh, that'll help both of you, uh, parent and child, um, get through it together. Yeah. I mean, I, I think scheduling is hard to come by. It's a bit of a luxury sometimes these days, um, but anything's, um, when you can schedule and creating a routine, um, a bedtime routine and, and sticking to those where if you got off kilter, um, you know, what's something that you can, again, break it down into smaller pieces. It doesn't have to be you know, every night it's going to be this particular time with these seven different bedtime steps. Um, what's one thing that you can kind of react, reinstate um, a routine into some of the chaos? Yeah, and I think it's funny. We we think we're all locked down inside our houses, right? I think a lot of times, but we can still go outside, right? You can still do physical activity. You can still uh, get out there and, and ride your bike and do things like that. And I would imagine that would help kids at least get the wiggles out or get their energy out of their little and then and then older children as well. I've got a next door neighbor who's got three teenage boys. And so you can imagine what their house is like right now. And they have a kind of a home gym in their garage. And all three of those boys are in and out of that gym all day long and then sprinting down the street. And and I don't know how they're doing it in this Texas heat, but um, I know she's a therapist. So I'm sure she's kind of recommending or prescribing that for them right now, if you will. Yeah, I mean, we do have, the heat. sorry, uh, internet lag. We have the heat in Texas, but we also have the space. I mean, I, I, I think, yeah, in most places you can probably go outside unless maybe you live in inner city New York and it's, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's safe to go outside everywhere, um, but that doesn't mean you can't move your body or you can't do something active or you can't do something playful, um, you know, taking a break from work or from, the distress, right? And finding something to laugh about um, and to just play. Uh, I think you can probably find that just about anywhere. And, you know, we, we kind of just dove right into the topic and started talking about some of these mental health issues that some people may be facing. But what are some of the differences in signs? You know, there's anxiety, there's stress, there's depression, and there are some more severe illnesses. So, what are like, what is the difference between stress and anxiety, first of all? The, the best way I've heard it explained is that um, stress is just the human response to change, be it good or bad change. Something really exciting can be happening and it's still kind of stressful. Um, you think about every wedding you've ever been to, people are really stressed even though they're all happy to be there and happy that it's happening. 
anxiety is when that stress uh, or um, just kind of natural response turns into something that is not helpful. Uh, it, it isn't well suited to the situation. And so you, you, can, you can get to anxiety through a lot of negative stress or just too much stress at a given point. But um, uh, anxiety can also build from some very organic places. And that's um, part of the reason why, why medication management can uh, help with that and, and other coping mechanisms can help with that. It's not strictly a, a behavioral way to address it. And then how about depression? What are some of the signs of depression? So depression is more low mood, feeling blue, feeling sad. Sometimes uh, the sadness feels a lot more or is expressed more as anger, um, but kind of that low mood, um, problems sleeping, problems eating, thoughts maybe that you'd be better off dead um, or hurting yourself in some way. I think the things that kind of, the thread that flows through all of the, you know, when is it time to seek help and when, when does it meet criteria for a diagnosis um, and our diagnostic and statistical manual is this, they all have this criteria of functioning. Like, is there a significant impairment in functioning in more than one area um, of your life that, yeah, either it's kind of this worry and concern and fear, anxiety, um, or perhaps kind of sadness and overwhelm that once it reaches a certain level may then warrant a diagnosis. That doesn't mean you have to wait till that level to seek help. Uh, you know, help can be available before you reach um, that, that kind of criteria. But. That's helpful. That's really helpful because I think we are all sad at points. And we all experience stress, but that's normal to an extent until it interferes with your everyday life, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Was- emotions, are, uh, emotions are normal. They're good. They're data. They give you information about what you need. Um, and if you're not listening to them and not allowing them and just kind of pushing them away, then you're never going to know what it is that you need. Um, and then it'll build up over time until your body and your mind tell you and demand attention um, for whatever it is that, that you're going through. Yeah, and I think especially as parents, I'm a parent of two littles, um, I tend to kind of put myself on the back burner and concentrate more on the, the well-being of, of my kids and my spouse, and, you know, you're, we're thinking a lot about our older adult parents at this time. And so what's some advice that you would give for kind of stopping and checking your pulse, so to speak, or checking back in with yourself to kind of see how you're doing? <laughs> um, I think that has to be kind of an intentional slowing down. Um, again, unless you're going to wait for those alarm bells, um, which, you know, could be suicidal thoughts or, um, you know, just frequent breakdowns. Um, if you will give yourself um, two minutes, two minutes even, five minutes would be great um, of just oh, time away um, and just checking in. You know, what, what do I... What do I notice in my body? Is there a particular part of my body that I'm feeling a lot of tension? And if you just give that some attention, oh, there may be some, maybe there's feelings or worries or thoughts um, underneath that, that um, if you just will provide some quiet and some stillness, there's a lot to be uh, discovered. Um, I think that also can happen in the context of relationships. You know, if you're isolating yourself, um, you're not talking to anyone, then it's hard for those things to come up spontaneously. Um, but if you're allowing yourself um, connection, whether it's even if it's at a distance and then allowing yourself to be vulnerable with people that care about you, um, then that might also be a place where you kind of recognize what you're feeling and needing. And I, I very much want to, Carly, you hinted at it. Sometimes those feelings can be, can be physical too, the, the, the tightness in the shoulders or the fact that you've got that cramp in your, your neck or your, your hip or something that is not usually there and you, know, you, you didn't put there through you know, yoga or, or something else can clue you in that, that maybe something is building up and you, you need to take some time to, to address it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how much tension and emotions we can store inside our bodies, right? 
Um, but I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and ask you guys about something that's trending right now, and that's text-based counseling or counseling done over text messaging. What is your professional opinion on that? Do you think that is a good option for, for seeking counseling services? Um, or is it more of like an entry point to counseling? I think we know a lot less about text-based therapy from an evidence standpoint and a research standpoint. It's kind of the same as the conversation about credentials in my mind that someone with credentials has gone to an accredited program and has a license and has just gone through a number of similar steps to say that, you know, what I'm going to give you um, is quality. Um, and so again, who is, I think, who's the person on the other side of the text can make a big difference. And there's just, there's a, there's certainly a lot of data missing um, and tone and pacing and um, yeah, that, that it's certainly different. I, I don't want, again, I don't want to say that there's a um, one right way to do uh, therapy. And so if it's something that you've tried and found helpful, uh, then great. I certainly think, again, it, some of the evidence-based ideas, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is about identifying your thoughts and whether they're um, rational um, being able to replace those with rational thoughts. I think those are um, things that you could do asynchronously with kind of these breaks. Um, so it might also depend on the presenting concern. I know that uh, at least the, the major platforms that I'm familiar with, um, I'm at least uncomfortable with the idea of interacting with somebody without being able to, to interact with them on a, on a live basis, either over the phone or over televideo or, or in person, um, just because uh, exactly like you said, Carly, there are, um, there are certain things that, you know, work in therapy with some space to, to breathe and try out and, and practice or whatnot in between kind of check-ins. But there are also a lot of uh, kind of safety assessments and ability to respond into the mo in the moment and keep somebody's attention um, and, and kind of get them to set aside some time to take care of themselves and um, uh, take some time out to address whatever is going on that is really valuable that I would be really concerned would be lost um, if you're trying to, to break up most of your clinical work into, uh, you know, 160 characters or whatnot um, at a time. Yeah, and so how do you go about finding a counselor for yourself? Is it is it kind of like online dating where, you know, you just, you pick somebody online, you kind of read about them, you go and visit with them for a little bit, and then, you know, you, you try somebody else or how does that work? I think dating is actually a pretty good analogy for it. Um, no, no good clinician will be offended if after a session or two, um, you come back and tell them, hey, you know, I appreciate what you've done, but I don't, I don't think we're the best fit for each other. For this like you're, you're not you're not really able to provide what I'm looking for anybody with some of that standardized training and a license behind them is, is um, definitely professional enough to realize that they are not the, the right person for everybody a lot of people come to at least our clinic um, through word-of-mouth referrals um, even if it's for for other services um, people are generally much more comfortable to go to somebody that they know recommends and so asking some folks that, that you know have been to counseling before, hey, who did you use or can you make a recommendation? Um, your primary care doctor also likely has some folks that they work with all the time uh, that they're comfortable referring people to. And like I said, it's, it's a little more of a, a shot in the dark, but um, if you do have insurance, your insurance provider keeps a list of local professionals as well. And that's, that is a little more like looking up somebody in the phone book or, or Googling, but uh, it is definitely possible to find somebody good through there too. Yeah, I always say therapists are just people. Um, so, you know, you're not going to like everyone you meet. And if you don't, um, I mean, as a therapist, I really appreciate when people tell me, give me some feedback of, hey, this isn't working. And then I can say, oh, I can adapt in that way. Or can we give it one more session? Or I can't. You're right. That is actually not the way that I do therapy. So let's find you. Maybe I can help you find a referral. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, and there are some good, Psychology Today uh, is one of the, the big listing organizations, not just for psychologists, 
um, but where you can read about what our people's approach to therapy. There's lots of different theories that drive uh, the work that we do or looking at the presenting concerns that they've worked with. If you have a specific concern, have they worked with that before? Um, but yeah, I think the word of mouth is a great route to go. Yeah, I know word of mouth is how I choose, you know, where I'm going to eat dinner if I'm going out to a restaurant. So I think uh, taking some advice from friends that I trust would be my compass for picking a counselor, especially when you're talking about somebody who's going to be working on your mind, right? So, so say you've chosen somebody, you've booked your first session, um, and you've never been to therapy before, what can you usually expect from that first session with your therapist? I know when folks come to see me for the first time, I break it down into, into three parts uh, for them because that is a super common question. Um, folks know that they want to get help and they don't know what's going to come and they're super apprehensive when they sit down in a chair and, and have all sorts of preconceived notions based on what they've seen in TV shows or movies or they're wondering where, where the Shea Lounge is. And I tell them, I, I'm gonna ask them questions about what is going on now, what's brought them in. Because obviously if you're coming to see somebody, um, you have some level of concern, right? And then I tell them, I'm gonna ask a little bit about the way it was before. What, what did you notice has changed um, to, to make it, is like it like it is now? Um, and usually that involves some history about how it was before and how it got to be where it is now as best as they, as best as they know. And then the third part of the conversation is what they want going forward. Um, is the goal to make whatever feelings are coming up go away? Is the goal to be able to, to go out and do something that they aren't able to go out and do anymore? Is, you know, what, what is the goal? What are we working for? And if you've got at least the faintest idea of those things, you know, it'll, it'll be a conversation from there to, to figure out where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. Yeah, I think the only thing I would piggyback is what's usually different from an intake from that very first session and um, then maybe subsequent sessions is often the intake is very therapist guided where they're going to have more questions. They're going to have a set of questions when you walk in, perhaps, and forms that you have to fill out. Um, and they're, you know, uh, Brad kind of gave you this broad overview of, but he's going to ask you questions kind of along the way to get this past, present, and future. Um, and each therapist is going to do that a little bit differently. Um, and then perhaps um, in, in some modes of therapy, subsequent sessions may be more uh, where you do more talking, you know, and, and there's less direction. Um, but I think that's something that varies therapist to therapist is how directive they are, how much talking they do and guiding they do versus wanting you to turn inward and, and discover and, and come up with um, material. Yeah. And going back to that idea that, you know, there, there are a a million different people under the sun and there are just as many different different people that are therapists under the sun to match them to. Um, it is okay to come in with some suggestions on how how you feel most comfortable talking or how directive you want somebody to be. There are folks that come in that tell me that you know they, they really just want a place to kind of talk and, and almost word vomit everything out and they you know they're not really looking for for a lot of direction or forward movement or, or, or shooting for a specific goal. They just want some space and that's fine. Um, we, we can do that. And then there are people that want the exact opposite. They want to present a problem. They want concrete steps. They want physical things to practice in between sessions. They want a lot of input and um, guidance on what they should be doing to, to change this or approach that differently. And that's that's great too. And then there's there's shades of everything in between. So. If somebody has a has a, a comfort level with one end or the other or someplace in the middle, um, it's totally okay to tell your therapist before you show up on day one or on day one. Hey, this is how I feel the most comfortable. Can you can you work with this? Uh, and odds are they can. Yeah, and and I know this is going to vary from person to person, but I got to ask the question: um, How long can you expect to go to therapy before you notice improvement? I oh, see so you've got data on this currently. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I muted myself. I thought I was already muted. Um, so our our research would show that by four sessions, most people achieve some clinically significant change. We measure that by um, we use a measure called the PHQ. Um, uh, you know, the majority of people come in with some kind of uh, depressive symptoms, and so going from a severe category to a moderately severe, um, that change usually happens um, in four sessions. 
um, what that looks like functionally from severe to moderately severe um, didn't mean that the depression went away. It meant that maybe your sleep's a little bit better um, or that um, perhaps one of the ones that I uh, that we usually see change the fastest, honestly, for a lot of people is the alarm bell is that, oh my gosh, I'm having thoughts that I'd be better off dead. Like I can't handle what's going on right now. I don't think I even want to be here anymore. Um, and, and that once you've reached out and connected, um, instilling hope um, hap can often happen pretty quickly. Um, and so that can um, sh show some significant gains early on. Therapy is not a linear process though. Uh, I mean, sometimes you, you know, you go to one session, one of the most, you know, a lot of people will come for one session and whether they didn't like therapy or they really, you know, got something from it. Um, that they didn't have before. I think both of those things happen. Um, and then I think sometimes weeks of therapy get really hard. Um, and if you're doing good work, sometimes you feel crummy, crummier than you did when you walked in the door. Um, but I would really encourage you, that's the time to stick with it. Do not drop out if, if you get to kind of one of those spots where it gets really hard. That means it's about to get really good. Um, so yeah, it's not linear. I, was say, I, I very much look at it like uh, and tell people to approach it like they would, um, you know, working with a personal trainer and going to the gym, whereas most people don't go to the gym and get what they need in a, in a single week or two. You know, every once in a while, you, I suppose you, get, you can end up with a wild card and they, they figure it out. But for the most part, you have to come back to it and you need to work on it on a regular basis. And then, you know, measuring it over time, you can see the progress and, um, you know, again, just like physical training or, or going to a gym there might be weeks where it's really tough or it's really hard or you feel crummier than you did to begin with but um just like carly was saying those those are often the times where if you stick with it you'll see a really big gain on the other side and, and get a lot closer to where you want to go any parting thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to share with our listeners today as they're navigating this uncertain time uh, th this is not an original thought to me, but I had a, um, a client say it to me from her pastor a few weeks ago, and it's, it's stuck with me ever since, and I've shared it a bunch. Quite often during times of, of really big change or, or, or national uh, or international uh, issues, we think about how we're not responding to it well. You know, we need to be better. We need to change this. We need to be able to do that, even with you know, some added stress or concern or routine change. Uh, and quite often those are times when we wouldn't expect the same out of somebody else. Um, you know, if our neighbor was that way or our mom was that way or our kid was that way or uh, some other relative or aunt or uncle or, or person down the street, um, we wouldn't expect them to handle it without a, without a bead of sweat or, or, or any effort involved. So, be good to yourself and extend that same kind of grace to yourself in a time like this. Um, don't, don't have expectations that you would be able to handle this when you wouldn't expect anybody else would be able to handle it without any stress or, or worry. Yeah, definitely. I think acknowledging the reality of the challenge that we're all living in, um, that if, if you haven't infected someone today, you've done a great job. Um, you've achieved a lot. Um, and so, you know, being kind and compassionate uh, to yourself during this time uh, to, to pace the fun, to survive and, and stick to the basics of, you know, trying to eat, sleep and connect um, are, you know, a good place to start and uh, just encourage you to, you know, if I could, if I could challenge every listener to do one thing, it would be to give themselves the two minutes um, today uh, to stop, to turn off all inputs and check in and just see if you hear something from yourself that you could respond to and be kind enough to act on that for yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you, Carly. Thank you, Brad, for being on the show today. Y'all are amazing guests. Y'all have such great wisdom in this area, and and I'm sure this won't be the last time we'll have you on. So until next time. Absolutely. Thanks Thank for having me. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Yep. Bye. 
And thank you guys, our listeners, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. We do this for you. So we hope you like what you hear. If you do, please subscribe, follow us, like us, share us with your friends. Pass it back, y'all. All right. Until next time, stay healthy. Thank you for joining us on Texas A&M Health Talk, a production of the Texas A&M University Health Science Center. Visit us on the web at vitalrecord.tamhsc.edu where you'll find answers to all of your health questions. Until next time, stay healthy.